This is a production of Cornell University. That's right, Frank. Uh, you know, 14th episode of the Cornell Turf Show this week. In a Cornell Turf Show first, we're going to have two guests today, so we're excited. Um, we'll have an annual Bluegrass Weevil conversation with Dr. Olga castro Maitska. Hopefully I'm, I'm getting that right, Olga, uh, from UMass, and we'll get her perspective on some ABW movement this year. Um, but Frank, you can introduce our first deck, a guest, um, board member GCSANY, and, and a, a friend of yours, Joe Lucas, if you'd like. Yeah, well, we'll get to Joe. We'll get to Joe in a minute, Carl. Let, let me get to the, I, I got to say a couple of things. I got to set Joe up and I want to give you a chance to do your tip because uh, I want to give Joe a chance for people to trickle in or pay attention because I'm sure it's going to be a treat. Um, uh, welcome, everyone, uh, and especially our guests. And for those of you watching live, uh, please think about some questions, certainly ABW questions, but we'll talk about some other things. Uh, Joe is here to highlight a program that we're working on with the GCSA and why uh, here in New York State. But nice picture of the winner from Thad Thompson. I will not use the expletive used by my man Thad out there in Western New York, but those of you on Twitter know it's colorful. And then a little picture of a, a stowaway here in Stephen Tucker, uh, a leading equipment technician, uh, one of his carts, uh, a stowaway here, a little baby owl. And, you know, you want to be careful. They look cute, but you don't want to mess with these guys. Uh, Brian Dagnew in, in Massachusetts posted such a great picture, I thought, um, boasting, hey, how good everything looks and no inputs. Obviously, he striped it up, got the mower going, but nothing else. And it really leads in nicely. Oh, we're up, oh, Carl. Hold on a second. So, okay. Carl, listen, you know what the conversation is today with, with uh, Olga and Olga. I'm not going to make an attempt at your last name, but I'm going to appreciate when we get when we get to you, you're going to tell me exactly how to pronounce it. We're talking ABW today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about your state park stuff. But why don't you take a minute now and talk about this project with RIT, the ERP project, where we're getting adoption of BMPs uh across western new york here central and finger lakes and we've got this wonderful infographic poster that you can grab uh at the website um mm -hmm. and carl why don't you highlight what the tip is of the week today yeah so you know this can go for a lot of different uh diseases or insect pests but but it's relevant to today's conversation on abw but you know scouting uh i, I know a lot of people hear about scouting and and that uh, i think for a lot of people just means kind of driving around and, and looking at things but uh, you know, we'll talk about today scouting, especially for ABW and, and uh, in high pressure areas, you know, a lot of our Long Island golf courses, scouting is a real intentional uh, data gathering exercise to determine not only timing of treatment, but but the where you're going to treat. So, uh, you know, a great resource for ABW scouting, our, our Cornell soil ecologist, uh, Kyle Wickings has created this PDF document for um, management of annual bluegrass weevils, and he goes through and really illustrates well the scouting techniques. If you're scouting for adults early in the year, as you can see on, on this slide for our YouTube audience, you know, using some dish soap, setting out an area, uh, kind of pouring that on the turf, waiting a little bit, and then counting how many adults you see kind of come up to the surface uh, as, a result, as a result of that soap flush. Uh, of vacuuming, uh, you know, vacuuming is, is one thing, Kyle and, and Dr. Ben McGraw and Olga, I'm sure you may have played around with this, but a really easy way if you can set up um, kind of one of these vacuum devices, Kyle, again, goes through this in his PDF document. Pretty easy to set this thing up. You just vacuum, and, and that's another easy way to scout. And then at the larval stage, again, we'll talk about kind of all these stages of ABW today, but if you're going to go out and make a larvicide treatment, uh, the salt flushes is the way to go there. It's a little bit tougher to see those, those small, small guys in there, but uh, again, all of this stuff is laid out in this ABW document, uh, and scouting really is going to determine when and where you're going to apply insecticides, especially for ABW. All right, Carl, thanks for that. And I want to get to our guest, uh, Joe Lucas. And Joe, before, before I bring you on, I want to just go through a little uh, presentation here, uh, highlighting some things that uh, some of the funding that you guys are able to generate will go to support. And we have, you know, a pretty elaborate uh, center here for our golf turf research, where we study all kinds of things, crazy things like, you know, Joe, when we ripped up that tea uh, and tried to get it planted back. And this kind of uh, real progressive research 
um, you know, doing it on golf courses is the kind of work that we see the future of, of turf grass research being uh, collaborating with you guys in the field so that you can keep the areas up and then we can do some of the research on these golf courses. Of course, you know, it costs uh, funds to do these things. Uh, we've gone around uh, the region burning things, looking at non-chemical approaches, uh, alternatives to traditional herbicides. And of course, recently with Carl's leadership, been doing extensive work on understanding traffic, the science of traffic on golf courses, whether it's, you know, the sophisticated work we do with footwear design with foot joy, or it's cart traffic and nutrient use. Um, we've also done a fair amount looking at uh, analyzing pesticide risk and Carl and Michael Beckin, a colleague uh, and former grad student, Doug Soldat, uh, and myself just recently published this paper, uh, culminating from a lot of our work with state park uh, research on golf courses, helping uh, our industry and the public understand uh, pesticide use on golf courses better. Of course, uh, we've done the wash pad stuff uh, as well, all kinds of practical environmental stewardship. So Joe, I've got a link here, pal, that I hope you can still see my screen takes us to the rounds for research page uh, that the GCSA maintains for us. And it looks like New York has about 81 uh, participants and you can click on that and find out uh, where all these things are. So let me stop sharing, take a look at you, welcome you to the program, give you a chance to talk a little bit about the rounds for research program from a GCSA NY perspective. Um, the GCSA NY, I believe this is our second full season as a new superintendent organization. Uh, we were the Western New York, Finger Lakes, Central New York region and we've combined into one association. And you know, I guess bigger is better maybe in this aspect. And what the rounds for research, it's an opportunity to raise some really good money. Um, and the old associations, everybody got little bits. And so no bigger pool, bigger money. And we sat down and said, instead of trying to divide this out and give it to everybody a little bit, we all said, you know what, let's give it to, you know, Cornell, let's give it to Frank and Carl, and let's really support our New York Turf University. Let's keep the money in state and really make a name for New York and the groundbreaking stuff. And, you know, everybody needs money and anything that we can do and can help promote better research. You know, like when we started doing that phrase mowing thing, I think we just started the tip of the iceberg. And I know my owner, funded part of that. You know, I think we wrote a check for like 2,500 bucks out of our own operating income. And you know what, we should be doing that in the turf industry and people in the state who are bidding on these rounds should know where that money's going. And if we can partner with Cornell, because Cornell carries weight, that name in New York carries a lot of weight to sit there and say, the money that we raise from this is going to do this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. The more we, we really can do, the better we can. Yeah. I mean, it's great for a bunch of golf course superintendents to get around and write some papers and talk and get an article in the local paper, but nothing stands out better than a PhD from Cornell talking about what we're doing in the state. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And that's exactly what we hope the future holds for the partnership. And I'm so glad to see the organization get off the ground, Joe, and that you and the folks in the leadership uh, of that organization you know, getting the newsletter out, getting the website up and going. We're just, uh, we're just getting started. So appreciate you taking the time to join me. And I can't wait to come back out and see those teas uh, oh, that I worked fantastic. on uh, all that time ago. All right. All right. Thanks a lot, Joe. Anytime. All right. So, so listen, let me, let me do a little bit of weather, Carl. Let me do a little bit of weather and let me set up you a little bit, Olga. Uh, and then we'll get to our conversation today. Um, I just want to remind everybody, just in simple, broad terms, you know, overall, the Northeastern United States remains, you know, quite a bit ahead of normal when you're looking at things that determine how the spring is progressing. But you notice there's this big uh, gradient in the middle of the country where it's been uh, pretty stalled for a while uh, when you get south of us. Uh, into the southern New Jersey, mid-Atlantic, and down into the Carolinas. I know that doesn't necessarily apply to everyone on the listening or, or watching, 
but for sure we're starting to see our soil temperatures getting creeping into the mid to low mid to upper 50s throughout the state except in the higher elevations uh, in some locations the Catskills and the Adirondacks but you really see the soil temperature starting to come on and of course we know that's the beginning of really driving things and getting them going so you got to have water well up to this point there's been a, a good gradient. There's been a, a generally a, a drier uh, period of time, some drought areas that are now benefiting from significant rainfall over the last couple of weeks. But as we heard this morning from our art, from our weather guy, Art D. Gaetano, here, here in the uh, Northeast Climate Center, that we're in for a little bit above normal temperatures and um, above normal rainfall uh, for much of the region. Now, there's going to be a strong gradient. If you look at these maps, where the line of rainfall is, is where the big question mark is. If you look in the precipitation, you say it looks like it's right at the Hudson Valley or Southern Connecticut there. Um, and so we're not sure where that line's going to be, but it's going to be a stark difference between very warm uh, and uh, dry and cooler and wet. And so we think uh, to the northern part of this line, it's going to be fairly wet. Art's talking about a, a couple of inches of, of rainfall over the next uh, couple of weeks for sure. And what the other thing that, that Art talked about was the um, whole idea that, uh, uh, that, that the mins were going to be much above normal. So the, the daytime temperatures themselves uh, may not be that warm. Uh, the high temperatures may not be that warm, but the minimum temperatures are going to stay uh, fairly warm through the through the um, th through the uh, nighttime hours. So, Olga, I want to give you a little bit of a spiel of some of the work that Carl and I have done uh, with the state park folks, and Carl's put together the data here over the years, looking at the environmental impact using the EIQ. Uh, of our annual bluegrass weevil uh, program, uh, particularly at Bethpage, but really on Long Island in general. We were able to associate um, about 57% of all the risks of pesticide use with either annual bluegrass or weevil or dollar spot. Now, I want to particularly talk about the work that was done looking at annual bluegrass weevil and, of course, many years with Jennifer Grant uh, down there. Uh, working on this as well. Now, Ben and Albrecht did a survey a number of years ago, looking at the number of applications, uh, number of tees damaged. And so here are the tees, greens, and fairway damage from that survey that I'm sure you're uh, familiar with. And then in our work, about 21% of the total risk of pesticide use on Long Island golf courses that we measured were, were associated with annual uh, bluegrass weevil. So uh, we instituted a really tight uh, scouting program. We, we looked, we took data, and then we began to target applications. And of course, we were also on the black course in particular, dealing with pyrethroid resistance. So over the years, uh, you could see we were able to reduce the environmental risk, reduce the uh, treated areas uh, on, on the golf courses, and reduce the number of treatments uh, that we were making to ABWs. We've been able to choose uh, softer products over the years. Um, and so obviously we hang this on scouting better, right, Olga, and, and choosing better materials. Now, recently I saw this paper uh, in golf course management. I haven't read the scientific paper uh, behind this, and, and I'm hoping you have some understanding of this stuff because here are the questions for today for, for you and me and Carl and everybody that's going to be watching or listening. I, I want to go through sort of where we're at this year because it seems like phenology and data might be uh, inconsistent, but I want to cover that with you. Um, we're expecting warmer weather, so I want to hear about that. And then obviously we've lost chlorpyrifos, uh, so that's going to create some questions for our superintendents. And then the larvicide only strategy where we abandon adult applications and, and go to larvicide. So thanks for taking the time uh, to uh, join, join us uh, on the show and welcome to the Northeast. And I wanted to use this as a chance to invite you and promote the things that you're doing there at UMass. Uh, pretty big shoes 
uh, to walk into, right, with the yes. great lady that preceded you. And I, of course, we, we expect the same things, uh, great things from you. So welcome to the Northeast. And let's not waste any time, Olga. How are the ABWs progressing through the Northeast right now? So what I see uh, from our area, and it's very different this year because it's a little bit confusing for me. We much closer, for instance, New England and New Jersey in this region, South region, much closer than any previous years. That's like in terms of the ABW activity, which uh, confused me in the beginning this year. So it's a little bit confusing. Um, uh, what I notice in terms of the weather, we didn't have this uh, stretch of the cold weather, stretch of the warm weather. We had this mosaic. So you have a couple of days, really nice, bright vehicles out there. We collect the vehicles and we start seeing activity. Um, so first vehicles we start seeing in the last week of March. So first vehicles on a short grass, it's really early. Like we wouldn't expect, golf course superintendent alert me for that. We start collecting, we see vehicles. And this was mm -hmm. a little bit something really alarming for me to see them that early. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we start monitoring since uh, late March. And significant increase because this mosaic weather happened uh, somewhere in the first week of uh, April, first, second week of April, we see significant increase in numbers. And then they seems to be hanging out there for until now. And so in the beginning, I was like really almost like almost like trigger ready, right? To like say what we need to just hurry, hurry up with everything. But at the same time, um, degree days wasn't in place yet at that time in like mid-April and even though we had this hot days and everything but because of this mosaic uh, pattern what I observed that uh, for Sadia was late and it's still a little bit late but I think it's because of drought a little bit that's mm -hmm. something for Sadia was late and um, but at the end so in spite of this mosaic a little bit uh, dispersed kind of activity of vivos even though they've been like compared to the previous year 2020 it seems to be much more clear like they out there and they stay there. We don't have waves. We don't have like it just at least what I observed from my observation. And I've been vacuuming them almost twice a week. So that's what we saw. They see what they stay out there. I dissected the vehicles too to look at the reproduction. They've been kind of uh, females were ready really like in the mid of April, I guess. They were not laying eggs probably because the, they were not full of eggs. They probably were mating, but they were ready. And by now they probably Oh, yeah. So thank you. Thank you for bringing up the the uh, life cycle and the reproductive and the feeding, because that appears to be what this new research is suggesting. You know, we, we try to time these adulticides with peak adult emergence, right? You want to get the most bang for your buck. You don't want to have to like get it when it's 50 whatever your count is and then three days later it looks like you did nothing there's a hundred more and then you make another and you know before you know it, you're making those five applications Olga right yeah. so yeah. we're trying to avoid that get the peak emergence yeah. but it's almost like the new thinking is you guys are going towards all right it's not just emergence but how many eggs uh what's in their gut what are they doing? Yep. And somehow that's going to refine our application strategy. Can you talk about that a little bit? A little bit. What I have, uh, I, I done some dissection previous years and it's like kind of with like along the lines what in the paper is too. And I did really significant dissection this year. Like all this season, I've been, uh, every sample we get because I was so confused with this 22nd of March or like last week of March, yeah, yeah, yeah. a first appearance of ABW. And I'm like, yeah, I'm dissecting them to make sure what I see there. So, and what I can say that, and another thing what we did, we did the two pitfall traps. We did pitfall traps near our winter insides and one of them near the fairway. So to make sure what we don't have these waves, right? So when we don't see any more vehicles in the overwinter inside pitfall trap, that means they all gone. And that's what we see very clear this year. So they've been like huge move, at least from location I had, huge move from them and no more into the pitfall trap on the overwinter insides. They all kind of move in mm -hmm. one way, almost like it's always, it's for biological, it's never like all black and white, obviously. So it was variation. Yeah, yeah. But so I started dissecting them. Uh, they've been, when from what I saw, when they on the short cut grass, they have like females ready, right? But ready for reproduction doesn't mean ready for the laying eggs. 
they do have fully developed, they have food probably, they have a fully developed, like recovered reproductive system because they go, uh, so just, Maybe for somebody who doesn't know, when they overwinter, then they on the overwinter inside. If you dissect them, you see only fat. That's it. You don't see digestive system too much. It's really clear, really transparent. It's like nothing like you can actually see really clearly, even if you do like. And same with our reproductive system. Ovary is transparent, translucent. You don't see it's really small, really tiny, not even there, no eggs present. You see like certain structures, but it's really Really in same males and females, you don't see them that much. And when they proceed in the season, when they start feeding, you start seeing this growing, right? The uh, male reproductive system grow, females already become like bigger and they become more well, sort of like, you know, like creamy colored because they absorb all this yolk and like preparing for the developing of the eggs. And then later on, you start seeing this eggs, fully developed eggs, but it doesn't mean what they're ready to lay them yet. So they usually pack I've, that's sort of my observation this year. I have obviously I, I need to support it with research a little bit longer, mm -hmm. but they usually pack about up to 14 eggs before they lay them. So it's a lot. So if you so, see a couple of them. So, yeah. so are you suggesting now that we might adjust our adult aside timings to coincide with egg, <laughs> a, egg development in females and target that adult population not just adults in general but a particular type stage of adult females and that by dissect this is so great we're having a conversation about weevil gut dissection yeah, right? Carl, where do you get this where, where else can you get this kind of program <laughs> nevertheless is that what you're saying olga that that by doing this we're going to be able to say let's target the females right when they're full of eggs before they lay them. So I want to bring a little bit different perspective of that. Oh, let's right? hear so I dissected that to support what our timing would be promote, right? It's correct. And it ah. seems like it is, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like all of this dissection this year showed me, yeah, they might have the eggs in the beginning when you just see them, right? But usually, like usually they start mating, they have about two or four eggs inside, right? So unless they pack with these eggs, they will not lay eggs. And it's for all the coincidence, lucky or not, it's exactly what we recommend. You know, like yeah. it's about what, 125, 140, okay. 150 degree days uh, for stadia, half green, half golden. So it's all kind of comes together, you so know? We, so we like the data and we like phenological indicators equally. They are yes. good, two good tools. Yes. So I like what I would suggest, like uh, I think uh, Carl mentioned that, you do need to look at the degree days pay attention to that they might be not specifically 125 maybe a little bit less but somewhere in this region have to look at the phenological and scouting absolutely mm -hmm. necessary tool and you like again you don't be patient that's what i'm like learned this year absolutely because i'm kind of more on the action anxious side so be patient you like look you see the first adults just uh, keep scouting until you see this definite increase in this plateau when they kind of peak it. Don't okay. worry. Some of them might lay eggs, but it's minimum of them. You know, like majority of them, you will target mm -hmm. uh, correct time. That's my All right. Opinion. All right. So we, we, we got to talk chemicals now. Yes. Yeah. Right. This is, this is the deal. Once we figure out we're going to, what we're going to do, um, we just uh, are going to see the end of chlorpyrifos here in New York state. Olga. I'm too, sure you've heard too. that news and, I'm sure it's going to ripple into the region in not much time. So what are you telling people that are probably using chlorpyrifos because pyrethroids didn't work so well? What are you telling the people in that pickle that might not have stocked up on the chlorpyrifos or just don't have access to it? What are you telling those uh, managers? Olga? I've been, uh, you know, like uh, I did my postdoc in Albrecht lab. So you imagine I'm from that school. Yep. I am definitely like I did a lot of research in the resistance. And obviously my view, yeah, larvicides, it's more about the answer compared to adulticides for many, many reasons. Number one, what we had, pyrethroids and chlorpyrifos. We're losing chlorpyrifos in this area too. So mm -hmm. it's not only you. So we don't have OP anymore. With pyrethroids, we have resistance developing. So it's like gone. And it's not only because we don't like it. it 
I, besides the fact that they brought spectrum not great for IPM and all of this uh, negative effect of the adulticides, what we talk about all the time. Plus, even if you apply, if you have slightly resistant population, there's nothing will happen. You know, like you will still have to treat larva no matter okay. what. All right. And plus so timing too, you know, like, so timing, it's really hard. This two years with the uh, 2020 being cold season here, do, um, and this mosaic pattern this year, I think it's easy to get them 2020, but it's re it's very uh, narrow window and it's really hard to get good timing with adult. Design. Right. And so that leads us to the larva side larva question, side. right? Yes. Which I got to ask your colleague, Dr. Wickings this morning, when we wake up at seven 30 for that ridiculous conference call that I've been doing for 20 years. Um, and Kyle mentioned that, um, you know, this is tricky. Uh, this is, I, I basically couched it by saying it's a risk. I mean, these things are in there and you're hoping you got to get the timing right. We're having a tough time with these uh, adulticide timings, but you seem to sound like maybe we've got better efficacy better. with larvicides and maybe a better handle on timing, but we still got to scout pretty closely. Absolutely. We still keep scouting for adults because this will be a ground zero to count when the timing for larvicides, right? So, and for larvicides, you have several options to work with, right? You have this uh, early larvicides, what we talk about when I was in Rutgers, uh, basically what it's target that larva would still feed inside. And you need to imagine that, but you cannot get it with contacts. You need to go with systemics here. And then we have antronilic diamides. Unfortunately, neonicot uh, neonicotinoids don't work really well for vivo. So you, like it's for now, we left for antronilic diamides for this stage, but this could be applied as early as of a position in the first and star. And this is kind of like negotiation between the uh, adulticides preventing, still preventive, right? You don't see the damage yet too much and kind of between the larvicides. And then the second option for larvicides and you have much more chemical classes for that. It's when they start coming out of the plants, it's about, we will target maybe two 0.53 in star and average, right? And we will, and it's in doxacarb goes, match points, spinozad, and uh, fern still works at this time. So we have more variety in terms of the rotating chemical classes avoiding the resistance. So you can go with either one. Uh, and I think honestly, I I'm not sure, but I feel like uh, catching, at least with my application, my research, it's easier to catch time with the larvicides when with adulticides. Okay. So listen, we're, we're at the witching hour here and I, I want to, you know, there, I got crane fly questions. I got a beautiful picture from Greg Stanley out on the East end of long Island okay. with a crane fly on his hand, but we're not going to do that. Cause, cause I want to ask you a, a more important question about ABW stuff, which is okay. Look, we go larvicides. We change the adulticides. We change the way we do things. And the last time I checked from talking to smart people like Albrecht and Ben and Kyle and mm -hmm. you and other people who are looking at these things and they're saying, yeah, but we don't really know what to do with the second generation yes, or summer. the third yeah. generation. So even if I get this one, I still got a little bit more. Let's just start with the simple question. How does anything we might miss now affect what you're thinking might be a second or third generation? Uh, so yeah, that's a hard, qu loaded question, I would say. Yeah, yeah. yeah, some it's really hard to catch. And uh, what I'm thinking, like, you know, like we all saying you need to get the first, like this overwintering for many reasons. You put your effort on that, you will have less trouble later. If you still have it, I think we're still going with the larva side. That's what I, I know that's most effective. And as soon as you start, you still monitor adults and coming from the adults. I see you see adults on that and like target your larva side application in during the summer. You know, like, and you decide what you're going with. And I know people do different combination in terms of mostly between the diamines and spinozat at that point, mm -hmm. but you, you open for the indoxacarp and even some spot treatment for curative application, people do different things like dialogues, but yeah. we want to avoid this one to yeah. happen. You know? Yeah, and the bottom line is, Olga, everything I hear you guys telling me is, chemicals are only really only a part of the solution here if you don't target these things right we're not going to have a lot of materials left because yes. you can imagine you know you start freaking out about larvicides and now you're making three or four of those a year and now you've got multiple resistance yes. um so listen i want to thank you for joining us 
a call. Are there questions? Or uh, I, I would, I would love. It. Now, Olga, can you pronounce your last name for me properly? Kostromitska. Kostromitska. Perfect. Appreciate that, <laughs> Olga. Okay, yes. Carl. Thank, thank yeah. you for joining us, Olga. A big shout out to Joe and the GCSANY. The auction is open, so go there. And uh, you know, we wish we had more of our uh, big guns on there, like my boy Jeff Corcoran. Get a nice little foursome at Oak Hill. Uh, I'd like to press him for that. So there's my shout out, Joe, to start twisting arms uh, here. Carl, get us out of here. Yep. Uh, thanks, Olga, again, on today's conversation. I can hear Joe snickering in the background because he's got an all bent grass course and he's he's letting those uh, ABW take out his toe really <laughs> willingly. Um, so, uh, and, and of course, thanks to Joe and the GCSANY for, for their support of our research program. Frank, as you talked about, we're very system-based. We like to do this on golf courses. That's very practical minded and and resonates a lot with uh, with superintendents around here. So um, with that, we'll get everybody out of here. Tomorrow, we're gonna have Sean Peister, a director of Longwood Gardens on to talk about some of his sustainability initiatives. That'll be a fun one. But uh, until then, uh, we'll see you all later. Thank you. Thanks, Olga. Thank Thanks, you. Olga. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate see it. you guys. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.